I would not want my fellow firefighters to have to go through a notification of a line of duty death. I had the uh, misfortunes of doing this, and it's a very traumatic and terrible experience. Uh, you ring that bell, and they know immediately why you're there. And it's from that second on, it's nothing but hell. And if it's something that could have been prevented, that makes it even worse. In the six years I've been your commissioner, 11 firefighters have lost their lives in the line of duty, protecting New Yorkers from the ravages of fire. Without a doubt, the hardest part of this job is when the time comes to meet with a wife or mother and tell them that their husband or son didn't make it. It breaks my heart, it devastates the families. It never gets any easier. What you're about to see and hear may be the most important advice you will get on this job from some of the most experienced officers and firefighters in the country. My hope is that what they tell you will reduce the likelihood that any of us will ever have to attend another line of duty funeral. Since this nation's founding, the fire department of the city of New York has protected its citizens from fires, medical emergencies, natural disasters, and terrorism. The FDNY lives every day the values of its mission statement. Service to its citizens. Courage to perform countless acts of insurmountable bravery. Honor in the service of excellence. Dedication to the mission. And personal and professional preparedness. Living these values has saved the lives of an unimaginable number of residents of the city. Truly, this figure, if known, would be staggering. Throughout every mission, the firefighters and paramedics of New York City have strived to keep citizens and visitors safe at all times and in every situation. But this dedication has come at a high price to firefighters, as we've witnessed hundreds of New York's bravest die in the line of duty, many performing acts of bravery and courage, but many who have died as a result of preventable tragedies. So this video begins a new page in the FDNY as every member is challenged to make firefighter safety his or her highest priority at all times in every situation, from a commitment to personal health and wellness to every action on the fire ground, including getting to the scene and returning safely. The intention of this video is to empower you to add to the department's mission that everyone goes home so that you go home, home to your loved ones. You will hear real stories from your brother and sister firefighters about their experiences that represent the angst of near misses, the pain from the darkest of days, and the wisdom that has come from generations of lessons learned. Please learn from them and we'll all benefit from the second chances that many of them receive. There is no doubt that your loved ones are proud of you, what you do, and understand how important the job is to you. However, imagine how they might feel if you don't come home because you did something that was absolutely preventable. The choice is yours. This is about having the courage to be safe so everyone goes home. I spent over 37 years in the uh, FDNY. I love the department. I love the members that have been part of this department for all those years. But I really do not want to go and speak to another widow. It breaks my heart. I have five children of my own, and I always pray that nothing would ever happen to me because I know how much they're going to suffer and the effects of losing their father or their mother or their brother and how hard it's going to be on a family. I don't want to do that anymore. I really, really want to get the message out to the members of this department who are the greatest members of any department or agency in the world. They are so dedicated, so conscientious, so brave. But we can do all of that and still operate safely. I'd like the members of the department to take away the idea that they have a responsibility for their safety. They have a responsibility to the men and women that they work with, and the officers, and the chief officers in particular, have a responsibility to make sure that everybody who works for them goes home at the end of the tour. 
I think this video is important to get the message out to the field, to the members in the field, that we need to change the way we do business. We had over 10,000 injuries to members last year alone. We don't learn from the past. We keep making the same mistakes. It's the same mistakes that keep injuring us and killing us. And these members have basically given you a guide to how to move on and hopefully prevent another injury or prevent another fatality. That we have a very common goal to keep firefighters safe. That's why the union's participation in a video like this is important because we want our members to know this is not management telling you or oh, be safe in the workplace. This is your union, the people that you elect to represent you. We're saying the same thing. We're trying to save people's lives and save their property, but part of the life factor is us. Outside of experience, nothing beats training. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how else to say that. Realistic training is key that uh, every fire officer, firefighter, chief officer should uh, strive to be a part of. If, if you're not going to train, then the complacency will set in and uh, anything that you think is routine will never be routine. Train, train, train. And after you train, make sure that you practice tactically what you learned. And if everybody does what they're supposed to do, to the best that they can, then we're reducing the possible risks of any injury. The, the companies that I saw over the years that were the best were the companies that drilled all the time. I mean, you don't have to be a super busy company to be very good at what you do. I, I like to, to think of the story of, of uh, watching Derek Jeter make a play in the World Series and they talked about how they practiced the play hundreds of times and he only did it once in real life in his career. And there's companies on this job that are good at rope rescues, and they haven't done it hundreds of times of fires, but they practiced it hundreds of times. And the companies that are good at many different tasks that are critical to saving life, because they practice it over and over, they're ready. Being a fireman, uh, there are so many unknowns that you cannot prepare for. So anything that you can prepare for or prevent you do that. A simple thing like putting on a seatbelt. Just a typical, you know, was, I think it was an emergency run, I'm not really sure, a little foggy on that details, but I was told it was an emergency run and uh, clipped my seatbelt on, a matter of seconds, and the next thing I know we hit a car in the intersection and the rig was, just kept going until, boom, spent five days in Kings County Hospital, had surgery, and uh, went to rehab to get back to work. Bulky your seatbelt. It saved my life. I, I wouldn't be here talking to anyone today if I didn't have my seatbelt on. Uh, we, we hit a solid brick wall. There's nothing but a wall in front of me. So, And uh, never be afraid to say any, you know, if you're not comfortable, always speak up. What we get paid for is running out the door at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, into a very hostile, very dangerous, very fluid environment. Uh, you need to be ready in every sense of the word. You need to be ready physically. Uh, like it or not, we're, we're paid professional athletes. The difference between us and a uh, guy playing professional football is he knows that his game day is Sunday. We don't know when our game day is. We're firefighters. We're using our bodies every day. We're physical exertion every day out on the fire ground. We need to be in the best shape we can be in. It helps every rank every firefighter, mentally and physically. You knew it was a job a couple of blocks away. It was, uh, you know, you could see the, the flames blowing. I was breathing heavy, you know, and uh, I kind of felt like a pressure in my chest, you know, like, like a burning sensation, but not unlike going out for a run. However, this, you know, didn't subside. It didn't get any better. It stayed the same. Normally, you back off into a working pace, and this never happened. I was. It was just steady the whole time, and I was breathing really heavy, trying to control my breathing, slow my heart rate down. And as I got up to leave the building, I grabbed one of the guys to come with me, and uh, I passed out. They took me to the hospital, and um, after running some tests, that's when they, they realized that I actually had a heart attack. I mean, I had all classic signs. It's just I didn't accept them as being, you know, uh, heart disease or, or, or something like that. I'm 48 years old coming up on it and I just thought this was how it was going to be. I was going to have to work harder. Uh, you know, I, di I didn't accept the fact that that even a, a four or six story walk up and I was breathing heavy and I had chest pressure. I didn't know it was, it was you know, a disease or, or, or it was, you know, a, a bad heart. I just thought it was being out of shape and old. 
Well, I have a six month old at home now, believe it or not. Yeah, that's starting all over again. The deal was I was gonna get back in shape and live another 40 years. Cause I got a lot of information I wanna give to this guy, you know? And I just, that night in the hospital, I, I felt I was letting him down. And uh, I'm not gonna do that. The buildings that killed firemen 100, 150, 200 years ago are still here and they can still kill firemen today. These same buildings, the same way they killed guys in the past. Uh, we need to remember the lessons that were bought and paid for in blood by the previous generations. Things like the 23rd Street Fire, the dangers of concrete over wooden floors, uh, the dangers of bowstring truss roofs like the Wallbaums Fire. Uh, these are all continuing hazards. It, we were second due engine to a high-rise fire on the sixth floor. When we arrived there, we were helping engine 265 stretch the first due line up to the sixth floor. When we got up to the fire floor, being the backup um, fireman, I actually had a junior fireman who had the nozzle in front of me, and I had said to him, let's take a step back, let's regroup. We went back down to the floor below because I just had a very bad feeling in my stomach at that time. I've been to a couple of high-rise fires, and it's difficult, and I believe this might have been his first one. So I told him to take a knee, to put his gear on as if they showed you in proby school. From everything, from the hood, the helmet, the ear flaps, the bunker coat. We batted down, we buckled up. Um, at the last second, I said, do me a favor, Jimmy. I said, let me go first, you stay behind me right now. So I gradually started to move up the line, and when I actually got to the front of the line, I came across the nozzle, but no fireman. Very lonely feeling, because now my first instinct was the first two engine and the first two truck, everybody's dead. So I remember closing my eyes, taking a deep breath, and say, okay, control your breathing. It's the most important thing, because you're unlimited there. At one point, I actually remember saying to myself, okay, you might have to call a mayday here. But then I was embarrassed. I was like, oh, you don't want to do that, you know. Then I said, okay, let me try to follow the line out. When all else fails, follow the line. It's my lifeline. So every time I attempted to shift my body and try to follow, just use my hand to follow the line out, I kept on getting burnt. It wasn't until that I actually felt the skin on the back of my neck and my ears starting to bubble when I realized, okay, I'm running out of options completely. I am about to burn to death right here and now. And then all of a sudden, I heard banging. And they always taught you, you know, if need be, you just follow the noise of the other firemen, because obviously they have a beacon and they're gonna to try to get you back. So I kept on screaming loud, I could hear you, I could hear you, don't stop the banging, don't stop screaming. And it was all of a sudden then that I actually felt a pull on my harness in the direction I had put my body towards and it was Jay Byrne from the uh, first two truck who I had sought refuge in the adjoining apartment. Just like they teach you once again in the academy. You have to seek refuge on the same side of the fire apartment. This way the wind effect does not blow across the hallway. He had left his safety zone in the adjoining apartment, crawled down the hallway to where I was trapped. Even though he has three children at home, his wife was due with any day with their fourth child. He put his complete safety out on the line, crawled down the hallway, grabbed me by the harness, and got me back to the point of refuge. Had he not done, done what he did at that point in time, there is no doubt in my mind that I would not be sitting here right now doing this interview. And when you consider that, even though I had my bunker gear on the proper way, I had the hood on, I had the helmet on, put the ear flaps down, had I not done all of what I was taught in Proby school, out in the field, that the damage would have been a lot more severe than the second degree burns I received on my neck and my ears. If you feel that you need to transmit a mayday, you need to give it, you need to do it. Because obviously your brain is telling you something and I was for a brief second embarrassed to go through the motions. And they always teach you never be embarrassed to do it I was burning, I was embarrassed to do it because I was afraid to have to look at the guys in their faces again in the firehouse.
If you want to make it home at the end of each tour, a couple of simple rules. First of all, never put yourself in a place where somebody else is dependent on to get you out. Second, know where your escape route is every time. Know how you're going to get out when things go bad. And the third one, know where your second escape route is when that first one gets blocked because things do go wrong that you didn't plan on. Fires are getting hotter, we all know that, and we're going further in. If we're not aware of what's going on around us, we have the chance of being caught in there. And that's where I think we're injuring more firefighters. The other issue in firefighters is construction. Building construction is not our friend. And if you don't know about the buildings that we are going to and fighting fires in, then go out and spend some time learning about them. What we went into the apartment above the fire uh, was an, uh, an SRO, and we just never found any sign of fire. But um, through, because of these illegal walls that were there, we were blocked off from the fire escape and from where the fire was coming up through the floor below. And it, uh, it wrapped around these hallways and trapped six of us in the rear of the building. I mean, it was a real live situation. It wasn't training in the academy anymore, you know. So not too long after that, the lieutenant started giving the maydays because the heat started to get really bad then. And you know, I remember the day in, in the academy when we were taught uh, Mayday transmissions, and uh, this wasn't like that. You know, you could feel the seriousness and the, uh, you know, the urgency of these Mayday messages. Kind of strange, uh, people think, oh, how bad was the fire, how bad was the fire? I don't recall seeing fire at all that day. You know, all I remember vividly is the heat that we got knocked down with. Um, I mean, it was just a tidal wave of heat that, that crushed us, and it just pinned us to the windows, um, where it was, you know, it was just unbearable to be inside that apartment. And we had to, like, you know, stick our bodies out the windows to, to cool off. And, you know, our, Lieutenant Mayron, the boss who was working that day with us, knew that this, this room was about to go and light up and that we needed to get out. And the only way to get out was to, to jump and we were five stories above the ground, but uh, we were gonna try and go that way rather than, than burn. That's what we did. You know, be ready for the unbelievable, you know, the unthinkable. It was a house fire, it was a basement fire. Fully involved basement, I was in the first two truck, my irons team, and myself being the lieutenant, we went in to search the first floor uh, the place ended up flashing over. After I bounced into one wall trying to exit, I lost my helmet because I didn't have my chin strap on. And my head started burning and I bounced off another wall and fell. And then my face piece started burning off off the back of my head. So I had to hold the face piece on. And when I came on the job, it was the macho thing. It was what the older guys were doing, not having the chin strap on. And I should have, you know, it was awkward to have it on. The chin straps have become much better and it is more workable now and guys should have it on. If I had my chin strap on, it might have given me more time to get out before I got trapped. He kept his um, mask on and if he hadn't done that, he probably would not be here. So the people tend to take it off to yell for help and he didn't do that. He just kept it on the whole time, which I think saved his life. If you have good habits, that's good. And I tell guys that all the time. I said, however you respond from the kitchen to the fire apparatus, however you get off that fire apparatus at every run you go to, it should be the same. You should be getting off the rig the same, whether you're getting off for a gas leak on the third floor or report a smoke on the fifth floor or fire, or fire out three windows on the first floor. You should look the same when you get off the rig. You should be fully geared up. Uh, we were first due at a two-story taxpayer. Uh, it was vented out the window, which looked good. We figured no problem. We stretched a two and a half inch hand line up there. Uh, what we didn't know was, in hindsight, was that the, not only was it vented out the window, but it was now going across the drop ceiling. So as we moved in with the hand line, as soon as we opened up, everything blew down on us. A couple of guys got blown down the stairs. The fire actually, actually came down the stairs, shot out to the sidewalk. May days were given. I not having my gloves on and my hood on, I sustained the worst injuries by far. You're a fool if you don't put your face piece on. I don't know. I mean, I always wear it now. I don't know why I developed bad habits years ago, but it can save your life. I'm a 
was a firefighter at Engine 302 in South Jamaica, Queens. Um, I had the nozzle at a, at a basement fire. We made two pushes. We made a push the first time and we couldn't make it and then we decided we were going to try again. And the first time I didn't have my hood on and I definitely felt like my ears have never felt before. Like, okay, this is, this is the hottest basement fire I've ever been to. So then when we, when we came back up and we made the second push, I put my hood on. And uh, I remember when I was in the hospital, they were telling my wife, well actually, well she has told me this because I was drugged up, but that they were contemplating cutting off my left ear. The doctor at the burn center told me that the only reason why I have my ears is, is, is because I, I put my hood on. I'll never forget the feeling when I was, I got stuck on the stairs and I was laying there and I, I, it, was, it was coming right up over me and I was, my legs were burning, my back was burning. And I, I remember saying to myself, clearly remember saying to myself, I can't believe that I'm dying in a basement in South Jamaica. Like this, this just can't be the end. It, 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 no way. That's, that's, that's my fire and that's my lesson. My lesson is, is that it, it, it can happen to you as much as you don't think in, you know, and I think in this job you need to have that feeling that it's not going to happen to me. But I think there's also the reality of, oh, it, damn, it can. You know, so what am I going to do to make sure that it's not going to happen to me? Or if it does happen to me, because we do get into situations that we can't control, uh, that, I, that I, um, I got everything up and on so that I'm as covered as I could possibly cover myself. It's like buying insurance. I remember, excuse my language, but I remember one of the guys saying, oh, this guy's got balls of steel. He went down to that basement. And, and I remember I said to the young guys, I said, you know what? I said, I don't think that. I don't think that, that it was very courageous of me to go down to that basement only because of how, how hot I knew it was the first time we tried to get down there. And I think that it would have taken more balls to turn around to the captain and say, Cap, this one's not ours. Let's shut the door, protect the stairs, and get it from the outside. Like, I think that probably would have, I think in hindsight, that would have taken like more courage than, than actually jumping down there. You know, like I remember when I used to play hockey, I, I had a hockey coach who said that it's very easy to drop the gloves and go at it. It's very hard to walk away. The, the lesson learned about safety to me is knowing when we're done. Because I think in my gut, I knew it, you know, but I, I think for firemen, the, the idea of uh, saying I can't do something is like hard as hell, you know, you know so, it, um, I, I think that's, that's where I would have been more courageous. There's a sign on a lot of buses in New York City, and it's, and it's a terrorist sign, and it, but it says uh, from the police department, if you see something, say something. And I use it in my firehouse, and I tell the guys, if you see something that's not right at the scene of a fire, get on the radio and report it. Let somebody else think about it or d decide maybe that, maybe that might be the last transmission that I needed to hear to decide to, to evacuate a building. So it's uh, situational awareness, very, very important. If this job has taught us anything uh, in, in life, it's taught us that your life can change on a dime. You will not get a second chance at a lost opportunity. It only occurs once. And uh, if you come up short, you're going to remember it. You're going to remember it for a real long time. It went from a level that was, was bearable to absolutely unbearable in, in, in a, a split second. The best thing anyone can, go out, can do is just go out there and and uh, be on their toes. When a member gets killed in a line of duty, it affects more than just the firehouse and the companies around. It also affects the member's family, much more than it affects the firehouse. I've been there and had to talk with the people, talk with the survivors, talk with the widows, talk with the children, and uh, it's a dreadful scene. It's uh, really bad took me a second to absorb what I was seeing. Uh, there was a chief and two firefighters in bunker gear who I later realized had come directly from the fire. They took me through the emergency entrance of the hospital. Next thing that happened was the mayor came in and sat down next to me. Later on when I composed myself, 
I told him he was the last person I wanted to see that day because I knew what that meant. What the families go through is just horrendous and uh, there's nothing you could do to change it except if prevented. There are a tremendous amount of people that have gone before us and we owe them a debt of gratitude. A lot of them are no longer here to speak for themselves. We need to speak for them. We speak for them in the actions that we do. Changing the culture of the fire service requires all of us to accept our responsibility. The department has given us tools, they've given us training, they've given us leadership, but if the individual firefighter doesn't accept his responsibility and take the responsibility for his own personal safety, he's not gonna be safe. Don't underestimate the danger of the job. Don't uh, hesitate to say mayday. You know, it's easy to say that the officer didn't do this or the chief didn't do that, but really everyone is responsible for their own safety and the safety of the next guy. And if you're not watching for your safety, the chief in the street can't see it and doesn't know it and is always is going to be behind the game. Safety is important to me because I am a husband, a father. I have two girls and a wife of 21 years. And I want to go home to them. I want to dance at my daughter's wedding. That is my job. And the thing that would bother me the most is having someone else walk one of my children down the aisle. You know, you're part of a group of people that are selfless and giving, and you know, there's not a lot of people on this earth anymore that do that or can say that they do it. You have a lot of people looking over you, you know, and you have to make them proud and be good at what you do. Never stop learning, never stop being safe. Always bear in mind and to keep in mind the families that are the fallen firefighters to say that you'll never fall down on the job, that you'll always stand tall. After what we endured, we came back and we are still the New York City Fire Department and I am damn proud of that. I still think we have the greatest job in the world. We just gave a test in January, 20,000 people wanted it. It doesn't pay that well and it's fairly dangerous. I'll go to work with those guys any day of the week. I would like all members of the FDNY to realize they have the support of the commissioner and the chief of the department in all their endeavors and that you go home to your family the way you came to work, safely and in one piece. And firefighting is a great job where we get the chance every day to save people's lives and those lives include you. Every one of you is important to us. We know that firefighting is a dangerous job. Do whatever you have to do to make sure that you come home. Drive safely, wear your seatbelt and make sure everyone goes home. Every run you go to, every job you go to, treat it as if it's the biggest, most dangerous operation that you're gonna be at and act accordingly. It's important to me that you go home alive. Stay safe. Remember, safety is everyone's business. Let's all go home tonight. Have the courage to be safe so everyone goes home. Just be safe, brothers. Take care out there. It's a dangerous job. every day to save people's lives and those lives include you. Every one of you is important to us. We know that firefighting is a dangerous job. Do whatever you have to do to make sure that you come home. Drive safely, wear your seatbelt, and make sure everyone goes home. Every run you go to, every job you go to, treat it as if it's the biggest, most dangerous operation that you're going to be at and act accordingly. It's important to me that you go home alive. Stay safe. Remember, safety is everyone's business. Let's all go home tonight. Have the courage to be safe so everyone goes home. Just be safe, brothers. Take care out there. It's a dangerous job.